Are you a business owner stuck in fear, doubt, and worry about what the marketplace will look like in the future? Then this show is for you. Strap on your seatbelt and get ready to disrupt and innovate. Here's your host, Levy. Welcome to today's show. I am so excited to introduce all of you to Shelley Brunswick, a visionary thought leader, futurist, strategic level executive, speaker, and an author with extensive experience in the space industry. She's currently serving as the COO of Space Foundation. She is passionate about advocating for space technology innovation, entrepreneurship, diversity and inclusion, and she collaborates with organizations around the world to connect commercial, government, and the educational sectors. With a distinguished career in space acquisition and program management leadership, she's published articles in consumer, technology, and space-related journals, and is a highly sought-after keynote speaker. I had the pleasure of being a co-author with her on Lady Diversity Power, and I'm really thrilled to introduce you to Shelley, and welcome to the conversation. Well, thank you so much for having me, and it's an honor to be here, and it's always fun to meet one of the co-authors for that amazing book on Lady Diversity Power. Absolutely. We spent about a year of our lives contributing to making that thing come to fruition and touched. The authors are a global group of women who are sharing some very powerful stories, so that was a fun project. I did the formal intro, Shelley, but will you tell the audience your story, take us on your journey of where you started and how you ended up where you're at today? Absolutely. Well, I like to think my story has three main chapters. And so the first chapter is enlisting in the U.S. Air Force right out of high school. The second chapter is becoming an officer in the Air Force. And the third chapter is where I am today at Space Foundation. So when we think about that first chapter, enlisting in the Air Force right out of high school because I didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up. I didn't have any money to go to college and I really wanted to see the world. And at that time, the, uh, the Air Force was a great way to do that. So I got to get stationed in Turkey and Germany. I became a personnel or HR professional. And I went to school at night using tuition assistance. So I was able to complete both my bachelor's and master's degrees, which allowed me to start that second chapter of my journey, becoming an officer in the Air Force. And that's when the Air Force made me a space program manager, and that started my 25-year career in the space industry. So I'm so thankful that they made that decision. I don't think I would have done that on my own. And then, of course, when my Air Force career came to fruition, I was fortunate to come to work at Space Foundation, which is a U.S. nonprofit that does business internationally. Uh, we have uh, several main divisions. One is Symposium 365 which is one of our signature events, the Space Symposium, that takes place in Colorado Springs every April, bringing together the global space community of military, civil, commercial, and international to talk about the future of space. And also our Center for Innovation and Education, which is all about workforce development and economic opportunity. Kindergarten through 12th grade programs, teaching teachers professional development to bring space into the classroom, as well as adult non-accredited education. So I couldn't have found a better place after the Air Force to land. So that's a little bit about my journey and what we do at Space Foundation. That's absolutely fabulous. In all of this, space excites our imagination, right? In, in the world, science fiction has driven tremendous innovation in reality because we were able to imagine things beyond what we could see and touch and do off the wall question. Are we alone out here? Is there life out, out in the distance? Your own opinion, Shelly, come on. You know, there's a lot of space out there. Literally, you would think there might be some more life out there. And what they have found is there are a lot of planets that are similar to Earth. But we still to this moment or this day have not found life off planet Earth. So we are a very unique uh, formation, uh, how we came to be. We do believe that there might have been life on Mars, but obviously due to some challenges with solar winds and uh, Mars probably was impacted by some, another planet and so on, that life, uh, if it still exists, is probably further down into the crust. Is it possible there's life somewhere else? There's a lot of options, and I believe we're looking for that with some great tools like the James Webb Space Space Telescope that's sending back images and information from the earliest formation 
action and moments of our universe. So we're looking, and I know there are some hearings happening on Capitol Hill that are actually investigating, are we alone? And so I look forward to hearing those hearings and those results just as much as you do. And, and I won't keep us on this topic, but those hearings, it's very interesting and very different in our world today that that is actually something that's being considered and, and discussed at the government level. And we will let that topic sit there because that is, I don't mean to take us down a, a rabbit hole. Our conversation is about disruption and innovation. And in my world, I talk about disruption as being something that we choose to do, that we challenge the status quo and a desire to make a positive impact. And that disruption leads to innovation. You are playing literally in space and influencing how we get off world and explore around us. What it is about disruption and innovation drives you and motivates what you're doing today? Well, I'm going to go back to your last question and we'll pull that thread just to have fun for the day. Let's talk about the X-Files, looking for life out there. And we talk about the Scully effect. You know, Dana Scully was an FBI agent and we can see from the work she did as a medical examiner, a science, technology, engineering, mathematic professional, and obviously this was a TV show, but the impact the Scully effect has had on women pursuing STEM professions as well as space occupations. So I want to pull that thread and now tie it into what does innovation and disruption mean to me? Absolutely. I love technology and innovation and disruption in the sense of space opportunities, whether that's SpaceX creating a new launch vehicle that drastically lowered the cost of launch that now allows not only private citizens to go to space, but emerging space nations and universities to put payloads and space science activities into orbit. So disruption is really about creating more access and opportunity to, for me. But the thing I really also want to pull is disruption is about leadership. And it's about a mindset. And one of the things I've learned over my 25 year career in the military and now in the space industry is that we really have to think of leadership differently than we did 25 or 30 years ago. The world has changed, the workforce has changed. And so some of the models we've had, the Hershey Blanchard, you know, Myers Briggs, and many of the others are still valid, but I think we have to look at things through a different paradigm than we did before. And so the new leadership style I focus on is one I've created called Global Transformational Leadership. And it involves three main traits those leaders need to have. One, in today's world, we need inspirational leaders. Two, they have to be authentic. And three, they need to be grateful. And what that means is one, who wants to follow a leader that's boring. That's not inspirational. That can't excite you about where we're going. That can't bring that passion to you. And then tell you how we're going to get there through positive communication. We want them to be authentic. They need to connect with us, right? We need to believe them and trust them and want to follow them. And they have that empathy which ties into that gratitude. I believe we're, we should be servant leaders, serving others before we serve ourselves, And that's about gratitude. I'm grateful for everything I've been offered throughout my career. I'm grateful for those mentors that helped me. And now it's about paying it forward as a servant leader to help the next generation come into the space technology and innovation sector. So to me, that's what innovation is disruption about. It's not just the technology, because we're going to have artificial intelligence for that, but it's really about the thought leadership that we as human beings have, and that's what makes us unique. Absolutely. And I love that you make the connection right to STEM and the opportunities for women. Generationally, I grew up in a time when I was told, you're not necessarily good at math and science. You should stick with the, the language arts type things. I believed that. My teachers told me that for years and years and years, I in early in my career in IT project management, the phrase came out of my mouth, well, you know, I'm not really good with numbers. And a gentleman looked at me and stopped, and he was actually a few years younger than I am. And he said, I get that that's what people have told you your whole life, but you're managing large scale projects. If you're not good with numbers, you're in the wrong field. And I think it's important that you're taking the time to build this up and create that new paradigm of leadership that is very much not the traditional command and control that we see in corporate America today, that you were trained up in in the military, and it has a time and a place, and in that environment, it is paramount 
that we're in that mindset. But in business day in and day out, it doesn't serve us well. So with this paradigm that you're bringing for leadership, which is where everything starts, what are the projects that you're working on right now? What are the, what are you trying to influence and with your work and your passion? Absolutely. Well, on the Space Foundation front, it's so wonderful to work at a nonprofit that's all about creating today's workforce and the workforce of the future. And I talked about our Center for Innovation and Education. We have three main areas. We have a discovery center that's open to the public here in Colorado Springs, but it also does virtual programs. We also have formal education, kindergarten through 12th grade, that we call the Leadership Academy. And it's primary school, middle school, high school. And so, for example, the high school project is about kids working together over a semester. And first, they are part of a a space agency or a company launching something to Mars, doing all the math and science and all those jobs that go with that, and then safely returning to Earth. But then they become a company. And what did you learn by going to Mars and how do you commercialize something like maybe the tires you took to Mars are superior to tires on Earth, especially in sandy locations. Could we sell those tires now on Earth throughout you're in Phoenix, that might be a great place for these cool tires for Mars. So now we teach them not only the jobs about working for a space agency or a company going to space, but now we're teaching them how to be a company, how to commercialize things, what sales, what social media, what's marketing, uh, what's business development. And this allows kids to understand that space is more than 50 different career fields. And this now opens opportunities for high school graduates to PhDs. And we're breaking down the paradigm and the perception that space is not for me. Many times women and other underrepresented groups feel that way. And so our program helps to break down that perception. And here in the state of Colorado, that program's called JSEP, Junior Space Entrepreneurship Program. We have partnered with Pikes Peak State College to make that college credit. So we're even giving kids a leg up as they go into college that they have already college credits coming out of high school. The other big thing is wonderful is helping teachers because when you can help teachers, you can reach thousands of students. And so we do teacher professional development and help teachers understand how they can bring space science and application into the classroom to make learning about space fun and how it's applicable and how it's really about jobs that are here on earth that those kids can do. And so it's really about empowering them. So that's what I love to do at Space Foundation. And next week, I'm gonna be going to a program where I'm gonna get to talk to college students doing a CANSAT program and highlight the amazing opportunities in the space industry. So that is one of my passions. And that ties in with what I do personally I'm a big advocate for mentoring, and so I do volunteer my time for a couple mentoring organizations. One is the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs. They have a Space for Women mentoring program. Although it says Space for Women, it is open to men and women, men and women to be mentors as well as protégés. So for kids watching, they have a Space for Youth program. So still check them out, unusa.org. And another program I volunteer my time for as a mentor is Women Tech Network. And again, even though women's in the title, open to men and women to be mentors and protégés. And I do mentor both men and women. So those are part of my passion about paying it forward. Again, under that global transformational leadership, having that gratitude for what you've been given and helping to pay it forward. So I I love all the connection points between your global transformational and I just blew that global transformational leadership, leadership, the key word I was trying to get to leadership <laughs> and how that ties into with what the work that you do with, the, with kids K through 12, as you were describing that program, what stood out to me is the traditional academic curriculum K through 12. It doesn't teach critical thinking and it doesn't teach leadership. And so having a complementary offering that then also happens to tie to space opportunities adds a tremendous amount of depth and breadth for the students who get to participate in that. And they should come out of that, those programs with a perspective that is so much broader than if they had never participated. So those connection points and how we're driving and how you're influencing the workforce of the future is absolutely fabulous. Thank you. I have a, I, and I have to highlight, I have an amazing team. The team at Space Foundation is fantastic. So I'm not doing this alone. We have an amazing team, and I'm grateful for what they do each and every day. 
Absolutely. And nothing of this size happens in a, by an individual's effort. It is always about a, the team behind enabling everything that needs to happen out, out to the, the students and to the community. With all of the things that you're involved in, we've done the very fast, high level, how good it all is. But what are some of the real challenges and roadblocks that you face in, in your role and in day in and day out? Well, that's fantastic. I am working on my book now, and it is going to include some lessons learned. You know, we both have a mutual friend in Hazel Harrington. As she says, you need to write a book. And so I'm working on it to get that book together. And so it's going to have 13 lessons learned in honor of Apollo 13. But some of those lessons learned are, you know, take advantage of every opportunity. You know, don't disqualify yourself from something you haven't been offered. You know, don't fear the unknown. Try anyways, even if, you know, you don't think you'll get it. And what that means is take advantage of every opportunity. You know, many times we kind of disqualify ourselves from things like an opportunity comes along and you might go, oh, it's that's not for me or I don't meet all the requirements or, you know, and I talked about when I was in the Air Force, you know, I, I didn't have money for college, but I took advantage of the Air Force's tuition assistance which allowed me to go to school at night and they paid a large percentage of the tuition and that allowed me to go to school at night not accumulate debt and eventually I was able to apply to become an officer because I took advantage of that so remember to take advantage of those opportunities and opportunities sometimes look like work they might look like volunteering for the hard project or volunteering your time to learn new skills so remember taking advantage of opportunities can be can be work too you know, fearing the unknown. Sometimes we do that too. We don't know what changes, you know, and change is happening so quickly. We're watching artificial intelligence. And as people are concerned, is this going to get rid of my job? And what is this going to do? And what will it look like? And so, you know, don't fear the unknown applies to me as well. Because when I applied to become an officer, you know, and I was selected, I was a space program manager. I didn't know what that was. I was a personnel specialist. I was HR. What is this space thing? I don't know what this is. And I didn't even want to do it. I was telling, you know, I was going back to my mentors. Can you help me get out of this? I want to be in personnel. That's what I'm good at. And finally, one day, someone from the Air Force Personnel Center called me and said, Sergeant Brunswick, this is what we need you to do. And I saluted and carried on. And I'm so grateful for that because that unlocked this whole amazing journey I've been on called the space ecosystem and creating more access and opportunity and creating new careers and job opportunities. So those are just some of the things that we think about. We are afraid of change or different things because we don't know how it impacts us. And we don't always take advantage of everything because sometimes we don't think we're worthy, especially if we're maybe not a traditional person that's in that type of career. And you can think of, you know, venture capital, entrepreneurship, space, coding. So, you know, we need to make sure that we find good mentors that help to bolster us and encourage us to try those things. And sometimes you don't make it the first time. So that's the other thing. Try even if the odds are against you. When I applied to become an officer, the odds were only 12%. And I did not get selected the first time I applied, but I applied again. And I got new letters of recommendation. I redid my application and I applied again. And that time I was selected. So just because the first time is a no, it's not no, it's a not yet. Not yet. Keep trying and don't give up. And think about SpaceX. How many times in their career did they almost go bankrupt? Did they have massive failures? Imagine if they had quit. But instead, they persevered, and now they have lowered, again, that cost curve to allow more access and opportunity into the space industry. Absolutely. I love your points about change. With my clients, we do a lot of work. Humans are resistant to change. We like to be in our, rout our routine, what's comfortable. And taking that risk, stepping into what is uncomfortable, not necessarily getting the outcome you wanted. Some people might call it a failure. I don't like to talk in those terms because I like to learn from it and do it again and do it better and get better results. And if we get results you don't want, you can ditch them and make a different choice and go in a different direction. But we have to do something in order to have something to respond to. Change is absolutely a part of our world and I our day in 
I think somebody told me that failure stands for first attempt at learning or something like that. So I think we just need to, you know, let's reevaluate that, you know, Tesla and Edison had many failures before we had the electricity we have today. So first attempt at learning, at learning. is a better way of looking at it. And it's not a no, it's a not yet. And those are those moments where we have to step through it. And it, it's really important. I thank you for sharing the story about, you know, your first attempt at becoming an officer with the odds of 12%. There are so many people with those odds who would never have tried, who would have been fabulous and, and probably are many would have been fabulous officers. Change our thought, our direction a little bit. We've talked about the roadblocks of where you're at, but looking to the future and the horizon, what are some of the really cool opportunities that you would like to influence those outcomes? Absolutely. I think obviously participating in shows like this is really important because one of the things I think we need to do is create awareness. Because I think a lot of times people, kids, citizens around the world don't really know what the opportunities are. So your programs are so valuable because they create awareness of what could be possible. The Scully, you know, the Dana Scully's out there, the TV shows, the inspiration. So we think about space and we think about all the hard science, but the podcasts and interviews and TV shows and music and movies are just as important to inspire that next generation. And remember, inspiration is the most essential skill a leader needs today, right? We need to be inspirational. So awareness is important. And then I also look at, you know, we talked about mentorship, but we need to talk about creating networks. Many times, especially diversity, and I'm going to, diversity might not be the term, it might be underrepresented groups because inner city uh, communities may not participate in space as well as rural communities. So it's more underrepresented groups. And what they need to do, what people need to do if they want to try something different is join organizations with like-minded thinking. And so what I recommend for people who want to be in the space industry is Join those organizations, join Space Generation Advisory Council, Women in Aerospace, Space Foundation has a new gen program. The United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs has multiple programs for space law, space policy, space use, space and water. I mean, it goes on and on. So find organizations that are like you, that think like you, and th that will help to create networks and you'll find other people who help mentor you and coach you and help you over the times where maybe you didn't get the scholarship the first time or into the school you thought you wanted to get into. That's how you're going to find those collaboration points. And here's an example of that. I have a colleague and she was an executive in the oil and gas industry just up the road in Denver and she has a geology degree. So she's a STEM professional and she went in oil and gas. Well, she's about mid career and she decided she wanted to be in the space industry and there's no like lateral really into a new industry. You kind of have to go back a little bit to go up. So what she did is she started joining those organizations, Colorado Space Coalition, Space Force Association. You know, she volunteered. She volunteered. Remember volunteering? Volunteered at Space Foundation. She started learning the lingo. She started networking with the industry. And it's been just under three years. And she is now the chief operating officer for a space startup company in Denver. So it doesn't matter where you are in your career, whether you're a young professional or mid-career, you still have opportunities to change where you are and go into a different industry. Many times I have people say, I always wanted to be in the space industry, but when I started my career, there was no place for sales or you know, social media or business development. And now with all the commercialization opportunities, you can absolutely take those skill sets, repackage them, learn those things about the industry, the lingo, the people, the networks, the connections, and you certainly can come into the space industry now. Well, and the space industry in the last decade has had a resurgence. I think it's SpaceX and some of those other things and Branson and Bezos and everything, right, has brought a focus back around that it's, when it's not just NASA anymore. and everything is so much broader and maybe it's part of the Scully effect. And maybe we actually can thank the X-Files for that last kind of lift back into it and from the glory days of the you know, original Star Trek era. But thank you for the conversation. One of the things that I really appreciate in how you tell the story is the connections that you make to 
how you can change in mid-career, early career, right? Different skills can be repackaged and repurposed in different places. And in a booming space industry, skills that we never would have thought of, social media being an example, right, of bringing into that space, I am certain are very, very valuable there today in, in the space ecosystem. I like to wrap up with a silly question. We share all sorts of our wonderful wisdom with the audience, but that you, we're more relatable when we're a little bit more personable or you know, in, introspective, I guess. Today's silly question. What would you do if you could be invisible for the day? Well, first of all, I don't think any of us can be invisible anymore. So I don't know if it's a silly question, but think about it. With social media, you know, I get emails from work email, personal email, LinkedIn email, Twitter email, Facebook email. Um, and yes, I do answer all those personally. Uh, so if you email me, I answer you. As you know, you reached out as well. And, um, and then we also travel and we're visible. So I think if you could be invisible for a day, and I think that's even for everyone to think about, it's about mindfulness. Sometimes we get so caught up in the do, right? We're like the little hamster on the wheel and we're doing and doing and doing and doing and doing. But some days when you can step back and take a pause and maybe not be on social media and be invisible, you can have mindfulness about where do you want to be? Not just your company. I mean, it's important strategic planning wise, but where do you want to be? What impact do you want to have? What thoughts do you want to have? Because your thoughts influence your words, which create your actions. And so for me, this may have not been the silly question you were thinking about, but I really looked at being invisible may not be what everybody wants, because I think there's a lot of people people who feel invisible, but I think it's really about taking that pause from being on the do loop and really coming off that loop and saying, is what I'm doing creating the impact I want as an individual, as well as for my organization? Does this bring me joy? Is it helpful to my family? And is this the legacy I want to leave or where I want to position myself for the next three, five, 10 years? You are your own entrepreneur and every once in a while, you need to pause and be invisible and really think about where you want to be. And I think that's why it's so important to have individuals like you, Lisa, to talk about with people, where do they want to be? Just like my friend who, amazing executive leader in the oil and gas industry, and then to make a career shift, scary, you know, what if this doesn't work? What am I giving up? What if, what if, what if, what if? But to take that moment to be invisible and decide how I want to recreate myself. So I think that's a wonderful question to allow people to think about reflecting and being mindful. That is a fabulous answer. And we've become so accustomed to being always on. And I've got the little air quotes going again, for those of you who are just listening, right? Because with those of us, right, we live in our video screens and we are on 24 seven and we do need to step away. And that is a different interpretation of the word invisible than I was thinking of when I threw it out there. But to that point, in the peak of the pandemic, I instituted for my own mindfulness and sanity, once one weekend out of every month, I shut down all technology because it was just so much coming constantly. So I appreciate the different perspective that you in the direction you took that question, because I think it's a really good thing for everybody to think about and to take the time to be mindful. This has been a fabulous time together today, Shelley. I truly appreciate you being here. And for those of you who are listening or watching, remember, don't get left behind. Join me next time. That's it for today's episode of Disrupt and Innovate. Head over to iTunes and subscribe to the show. Every single week, one lucky listener that posts a review on iTunes will win the grand prize drawing, a $15,000 private VIP day with Lisa Levy. And be sure to head over to disruptandinnovate.com and get your free copy of Lisa's gift. And join us on our next episode.